Most estimates uh, throughout the Western world assess uh, that within three years, uh, Iran, if it isn't stopped, will have a full-blown nuclear arsenal. The IAEA report indicated that not only were they working on nuclear triggers, they were working on uh, uh, computer simulations of nuclear tests and uh, nuclear warhead designed for ballistic missiles. Um, so this is fairly clear uh, that uh, uh, that um, not only is Iran, as Israel has been stating for the past seven years or eight years since it was first made public, uh, the nuclear uh, program was made public, is in fact developing nuclear weapons and there's no room any longer for doubt about it. It's also clear that the, is that the American uh, uh, national intelligence estimate about Iran's nuclear program that was published in uh, November of 2007 was a deliberate lie. Uh, that was uh, made for political reasons by U.S. intelligence professionals and that its clear objective was to prevent then-President Bush from taking any concerted action to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. And I think that this harsh indictment is borne out by fact, not by innuendo, not by accusation, but by fact that this information was knowable and was known at the time that that false uh, national intelligence estimate was published and that is an indictment uh, that it seems to me um, both the U.S. Congress and the U.S. public has the right and responsibility to get a full accounting for because it uh, is something that moving ahead uh, may well require a commission like the 9-11 uh, commission to sort out and it would be nice if that could be done before millions of people are killed. Now. Given the threat, I think everybody understands that Iran is an existential threat to Israel and Iranian nuclear arsenal is an existential threat to Israel given that Iran's leadership uh, threatens Israel with annihilation on a regular basis. But I think that it's important in the remaining seven minutes or so that I have you uh, to discuss two things. One is what threat does Iran manifest to the United States? And the other one is what a uh, possible Israeli strike would accomplish. So and one of the things that I find most troubling about the media accounts or, or coverage of the Iranian nuclear program is that it's always uh, said in respect to, it's always reported in respect to what this means for Israel, that it is an existential threat to Israel. I think that uh, it's also uh, an acute uh, national security threat to the United States of America, and I think that uh, uh, the evidence to that uh, contention is, is fairly overwhelming. Most recently, of course, we had the foiled uh, Iranian terror attack in Washington, D.C., where they were attempting to infiltrate terrorists into U.S. territory through Mexico, and the aim of that uh, terrorist network was to bomb targets here in Washington, including a restaurant frequented by the Saudi ambassador as well as by many members of uh, the U.S. Senate. They were supposed to bomb the, U the Israeli embassy here as well as the Saudi embassy. This, is, uh, these are, uh, this indicates planning for strategic strikes against, US, against the U.S. in the U.S. capital uh, by Iran at a time when Iran is supposedly very frightened of the United States because of the U.N. Security Council sanctions that have already been implemented. So it shows two things. One is that Iran is not at all deterred by the international program it has been subjected to over the past several years since the initial ex, uh, exposure of its nuclear program and also that they don't hesitate to use spectacular acts of terrorism and irregular warfare as a strategic arm of their armed forces. Um, we also have the 1992 and 1994 bombings that were taken, uh, carried out by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps in Buenos Aires attacking the, bombing the Israeli embassy and the Jewish community center there. So here too we have indications that Iran uh, is not uh, dependent upon ballistic missiles, ICBMs or anything else to attack targets uh, uh, 10,000 miles from their shore, which means that Iran is fully capable of taking nuclear devices, whether they're dirty bombs or EMPs or whatever it happens to be, to attack the United States. And the fact that Israel is the first target on their list does not mean that Israel is the only target on their list. And in fact, they, they see the world as a target-rich environment. 
and particularly the United States of America, aside from Israel, as a place that they would like to target with the aim of destroying. Um, so I think it's very important to note this and to highlight this because people keep thinking apparently that since Iran keeps fingering Israel that they're off the hook in terms of the danger manifested by Iran's nuclear weapons program and this is uh, demonstrably untrue and so that when you think about the possibility of an Israeli strike on Iran's nuclear installations which has been so discussed in the media in the past two weeks we have to first and foremost recognize that if Israel does carry out a solo attack on Iran's nuclear installation, that the United States will have to see this as Israel essentially doing the dirty work that the U.S. refuses to do on its own behalf and on behalf of its own security. Now, a lot of people have said, well, we hope that Israel doesn't attack because they won't do it well. And then the situation will be far worse than it is today because you're going to have a wounded Iran that isn't going to be destroyed. So. I'm sure in the media you've heard a number of speakers giving that argument, and so I'm going to give the contrary argument. In the limitations of time, I'm just going to center on my arguments and not on the arguments opposing an Israeli strike. So first of all, I'm no expert on bombs and payloads and what this or that kind of bomb could or couldn't do in terms of devastation. Um, but what we already know is that Israel has uh, if not the best electronic warfare capabilities, then electronic warfare capabilities that are equal to the United States' electronic warfare capabilities. And just today in the news, we have a story from Eli Lake of the Washington Times indicating that part of an Israeli strategy for attacking Iran's nuclear installations would involve neutralizing their entire uh, electromagnetic um, sphere and neutralizing their anti-aircraft uh, batteries uh, and their internet and their command and control session. So, you know, when you read something in the paper, you wonder whether it's true or not, but I think that we've seen over the past several years, particularly with the Israeli attack on the Syrian nuclear installation in 2007, that Israel does have the capacity to neutralize fairly sophisticated air defense uh, uh, installations. Um, and I think that at a minimum, Israel would have the ability through bombing and missile campaign against Iran's nuclear installations, uh, the capacity to th send back progress on that uh, program by a year or two, <coughs> at a minimum. So what would we get if Israel was able to, uh, to delay Iran's nuclear progress by 20, 12 to 24 months? What would that buy us? Well, I think one of the things that it would buy us is time to allow other events to take place. And specifically in that area, I, I can think of two events. One is we have to understand that an attack by the Jews of Iran at a time when they're being led by genocidal anti-Semites would have an enormous psychological impact both on the regime as well as on the people of Iran. Let's remember what happened in 2009. You had the largest uh, pro-democracy insurrection in an Islamic country that we've ever seen. And that uh, Green Revolution was violently put down by the regime. Today the regime is, lacks any serious public support among the Iranian people. But the success that the regime had in putting down that regime was due in large part to the fact that no serious international a uh, actor stood on the side of the Green Movement. In particular, the United States of America effectively sided with the mullahs against the anti-mullah protesters, the Green Movement, by doing nothing. And so, as a consequence of the regime's ability to withstand the Green Revolution of 2009, both the leaders of Iran, as well as the people of Iran, to a greater or lesser degrees, have become convinced of the immunity of the regime to outside pressure. That the world is simply too intimidated, too frightened of the mullahs to do anything. And this is, of course, a massive strength that the mullahs and the ayatollahs are able to wield against the Arab people. That here, even the United States of America didn't come to your defense. So the psychological blow of having a serious strike undertaken against Iran's nuclear installations, not even by the great Satan, but by the little bitty one, uh, would, uh, I think, uh, exact an enormous psychological toll 
on the regime's sense of immunity as well as on the people of Iran's sense of empowerment, that they actually can do something. If little Israel did something, then certainly the massive 70 million strong Iranian people can overthrow this government. And that, of course, is an important thing. A lot of people say, well, they all want nuclear bombs as well. And so I would just remind uh, you that there's a very big difference between, say, Stalinist Russia fielding a nuclear arsenal and Great Britain fielding a nuclear arsenal from the, from the perspective of what kind of threat uh, that arsenal uh, constitutes for global peace and security. So I'm not saying that an Iran post Ayatollahs will be the West's best friend the way that the Shah of Iran was. <coughs> but I am saying that at a minimum, a successor regime would be a lot more disorganized, a lot less uh, uh, inherently anti-American and anti-Semitic than the current one. And as a result, at a minimum, it would present less of an immediate threat to global peace and security, even if it had nuclear weapons, than the current regime does. So I think that, in summary, um, it is a distinct possibility that Israel will attack Iran and its nuclear installations. There is a distinct possibility that such an attack uh, will not complete the task, but that it will, in fact, have an ameliorative, ameliorative, ameliorative impact on the, on the project and um, that will set it back and allow other, other patterns, other developments to ensue inside of Iran that will all improve the situation uh, from a strategic perspective and also I think from a domestic political perspective for the Iranian people. And again, I think that the United States is vastly underestimating uh, the level of threat that an, the Iranian nuclear program constitutes to the United States. And uh, perhaps in this case, it should be lucky that it's Israel and not another country that is first on the target list, because Israel actually is not going to allow Iran to acquire nuclear weapons. So thanks very much. Uh, let's, let's open it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Please wait for the mic if you have a question. And I'm going to actually ask one first, taking the privilege here. Uh, can you talk about this a little more specifically about the threats to the U.S.? I can. Um, but Dave, uh, can you get me my Coke? <coughs> Thanks. Do you want to sit? You're no, I'm fine. I'm, I'm really pregnant, but I'm just thirsty. Okay. Um, <coughs> so the threats to the United States, again, um, you know, it, it's like the question about why is Iran developing the Shihab three and Shihab four ballistic missiles. Is it for Israel? Uh, it are, is the Shihab three uh, ballistic missile and the Shihab four ballistic missile, are they aimed at Israel? And I would argue that the answer is not necessarily. I think that they're more of a threat to Europe than they are to Israel because with its terrorist proxies, uh, Hamas and Hezbollah in Gaza and in Lebanon, uh, uh, the Iranians have a lot of other means to attack Israel than wasting ballistic missiles on on Tel Aviv. I mean, uh, Hezbollah and Hamas are Iranian proxies, and they have the missile capacity as well as the uh, artillery capacity to uh, engage in unconventional strikes against Israel, whether it's with chemical weapons or with a nuclear device that could be transferred from Iran to these areas um, with uh, minimal problem. And so, you know, when people talk about the Iranian missiles, they note uh, on the margins that they can reach southern Europe, but they don't mention that actually the, there is a higher likelihood that it, Iran is developing these ballistic missiles in order to strike Europe than they are to strike Israel, where they have a lot of other options for attack, more simple uh, and cost-effective. Uh, as to the United States, I think that it's very important to recognize that the Iranian threat to America, similar to the threat that it manifests to Israel, um, is not simply a long-range threat that you need them to develop ICBMs in order to take out uh, sites or attack the United States of America. You don't even necessarily need to import terrorists from Mexico. We already know that Hezbollah is active in the United States. There was a uh, Hezbollah cell that was broken up, I think, in 2001 after they were found um, in a cigarette uh, importation scheme from North Carolina to Michigan to fund uh, purchases of war material in the United States for Hezbollah back in Lebanon. So you already have proven uh, Hezbollah 
presence on U.S. on U.S. soil. But even more than that, you have an enormous Iranian presence in the Western Hemisphere, in Latin America, in South and Central America, in Nicaragua, in Ecuador, in Uruguay, and in Venezuela. And uh, these, we're talking about thousands of Iranian operatives that are there that come to Latin America, are provided with Venezuelan passports at the, at the uh, airport in Caracas when they land in the military hangar there and are, go unchecked by immigration officials in the Venezuelan immigration uh, agency. And then from there are dispersed throughout Latin America. And so, you know, this is all documented uh, copiously by uh, U.S., I would think, agencies and also by the U.S. media. It's just that it's not given any, uh, it, it's not subject to much analysis in the way of what this means for U.S. national security. But I think that anybody willing to consider the dots and think about putting them together recognizes that Iran is building up a substantial capacity to attack the United States right here in the backyard of the United States in Latin Central America. Think about that also in terms of the upcoming Nicaraguan elections and whether the United States wants to perhaps get involved in helping uh, opponents of the Sandinista regime to be elected. At any rate, I think when you look at the way that Iran has systematically built up its presence in the Western Hemisphere, just as it's built up its terrorist proxy network in the Middle East and in Israel, you recognize that just as I say, this is in fact a regime that has global ambitions and aspirations to destruction. When they say death to Israel and death to America, it's not just a slogan. They actually have taken action to at least advance this aim uh, in a very assiduous way over the past two decades. And that is a very big and growing threat to U.S. national security. Uh, Dan? And then what do you I know it's not normally your job to be at all upbeat, but we have the potential of something maybe good happening in the near future. If uh, the Syrian government goes down and has a change of government, what would be the strategic impacts on Iran's ability to project power in the region? So, yeah, I think that what's happening in Syria is good, as opposed to what happened in Egypt, which is bad, because, uh, or in, to that degree, uh, Libya and Tunisia as well, because you have a situation where an enemy regime of the United States of America and, of course, of Israel is now being threatened with overthrow, as opposed to an allied regime with the United States or a neutral regime with the United States. Um, and at a minimum, if Assad is, is brought down, um, you will have a weaker regime inside of Syria, and you will have a regime that is not a, an effective colony of Iran, so that the, uh, the essential support logistically that Syria provides to Hezbollah in Lebanon will at a minimum be uh, diminished in a significant way. And so you can see the possibility of perhaps allowing the majority of Lebanese who oppose Hezbollah the prospect of being able to assert uh, their right to control that country in a democratic way, something that has been denied them after two consecutive elections, which Hezbollah lost but was able to, through force, uh, force its will upon the Lebanese government and the Lebanese armed forces to the point where today the United States in funding the Lebanese armed forces is effectively funding the Hezbollah and arming it because the Lebanese armed forces are completely dominated by Hezbollah, which is the strongest military force in Lebanon. So if Syria's Assad regime is overthrown, we may see uh, the first prospect so far of a democratic takeover of non-Shiite Iranian terrorist proxies in Lebanon, which would be a good thing. The bad thing that we have to keep in mind is that the opposition that's been organized against Assad has been organized by Turkey and by Turkey's al-Qaeda affiliate IHH, which is allied with the regime. It is the same organization that organized the 2010 flotilla to Gaza. It was considered by the previous government in Ankara to be so extreme and so dangerous they didn't even allow IHH humanitarian operations to take place in the aftermath of the 1999 earthquake in Armenia. I simply didn't want them there. They didn't want them to have the opportunity to propagate their message to the victims of that earthquake. So 
This is a very radical group. It has a proven track record of using violence, and it is uh, closely allied, if not an integral part, of the AKP regime in Ankara. And they have been organizing the uh, Syrian opposition in Ankara with the full support of the U.S. government. And the opposition that they have uh, organized there is dominated by the Muslim Brotherhood, which has a majority of members in the opposition that's now being supported by the U.S. government. Now, there are other options with Syria. I mean, Syria is a very uh, a multi-ethnic state. They have 20 percent of the Syrians are Kurds. They have a very large Sunni population there. They have Christians there. They have Syriacs there. They have um, various ethnic groups there, Druze. And they're not being represented by this opposition force, apparently, that is being supported by the United States and sponsored by the Turkish government. And these are forces that seek a federal Turkey, which from an Israeli and I think from a regional perspective would be the best of all possible worlds, because if you had a federal government in Syria, you would have no Syria center of power inside of Damascus that could both terrorize Syrian people and also act as a state sponsor of terrorism because it would be too weak. Carol, um, so that's we basically need to the situation up. in Syria. Okay, thank you. And um, I'm, I'm sorry, we really need to get to the next speaker. Um, could we do a very short answer I don't to a know, very short question? <laughs> Sarah. Yes, Sarah. Carolyn, excellent job, and I tend to agree with you, but I've heard a lot of people on the other side, so I'm going to play the devil's advocate. The, um, the goals of such a strike are very modest by Israel. Um, they're talking about taking it back um, 20 to 24 months. We know that there are many, many... Um, underground plants in Qum, in Bashar, in Antans. There's not, um, this is not like, you know, Osirak in, in Iraq. Um, and we know that um, if such a move were to be made, that um, um, Ahmadinejad would just give an, a wink and a nod to um, Sheikh Nasrallah of Hezbollah and that they do have 40 to 50,000 missiles in the north of Israel, and they've said that they're... So what, what's the question? Yeah, so the, get question the, question, is, the question is, is the risks of doing this really worth the benefits since the goals are so modest? If we're, only talk, we're not talking about eliminating the bomb. We're talking about, you know, just taking... You know, it there's, an old, there's an old Jewish joke about uh, this uh, tyrant who announces that he wants to kill the Jewish community of a particular country. And so the chief rabbi of the community... He goes to the tyrant and he says, look, I'd like a stay of execution for long enough to teach your dog how to talk. And the, the tyrant said, what do you mean? My dog will never learn. And he said, I can make your dog learn how to talk in a year. If you give me your dog and you protect the Jews for a year, I'll teach your dog how to, and you give me a year, I'll teach your dog how to talk in a year. And so the tyrant said, be my guest. You can have a year, take the dog. So the rabbi comes back to the community with his dog. And they look at him, they say, Rabbi, what's your problem? You're crazy. What are you doing? When you're not going to teach this dog how to talk. He said, a year is a year. The dog may die. The king may die. Lots of things can happen. In the meantime, we have a year. The point is that when you're constantly seeking perfection and you want absolute perfect results every time, you're, never gonna do, you're either never going to do anything or you're going to fail miserably because perfection is not an option for anybody. It doesn't matter how powerful they are. And the question is, if you take a partial measure to deal with a very large problem, if you do a cost-benefit analysis of what you've done or what the likely outcome of what you're considering doing, you'll see that no, nothing's perfect, and no, you're not going to reach some sort of utopian conclusion at the end. Uh, but you have to answer the question, are you going to be relatively better off having acted or are you going to be relatively worse off having acted? And I think that one of the problems with much of the analysis that we've seen about Iran is that it is based upon an expectation of perfection, which certainly Israel and I don't think anybody can reach. And, and again, in the balance, when I look at it, it seems to me that the positives of what can likely occur in the result of a partial Israeli strike against Iran's nuclear installations is better than the certain conclusion that we'll have 
particularly looking at the fact that the IAEA and the U.S. government are not willing to do anything. Thank you so much. Way. That's great. Thank